Hi, I'm Rachel Slaba. I'm a program director here at ARPA-E, and I run our advanced vision program. And I'm Joel Fetter. I work with ARPA-E's technology to market group on vision programs um, and a range of other topics. Uh, Rachel, it's been almost three years, um, and uh, you're, you're rolling out of the agency onto the next chapter of your life. Um, we've put almost $100 million in advanced nuclear technologies. Um, you know, take us back to when you joined, what, why you joined, and, and why you thought uh, nuclear was a compelling space for ARPA-E to invest. Yeah, so I've been interested in nuclear energy for a long time because it has the ability to create a really large amount of low-carbon energy. Um, and ARPA-E saw that too, and they were interested in really filling that gap in their portfolio. Because if you look down the line at what a really clean energy grid is going to look like, you're going to need what's called a firm carbon or a firm resource, which is something that you can control and turn up and down. And so nuclear energy has the ability to integrate really well with large amounts of wind and solar. And nuclear energy itself is in the midst of rebooting itself with some really new and creative ideas. And so ARPA-E wanted to go move that space forward so the technologies would be ready in a faster timeline um, and hopefully at a more economically viable price point. That's right. And I would not um, limit the um, scope to uh, low carbon. I think that the international dimension is really crucial as well. All of our major trading partners and you know, some, of our, um, you know, some of our competitor nations are moving out very aggressively to this, this space as well. So there's a big question of who's going to own this space in the, in the future. Um, so you know, tell me a little bit about the programs that RPE has you know, sort of stood up in this, in this space and, 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 and what, they, what they set out to do. Yeah, we have a collection of programs that complement one another um, that are really targeted at what are the barriers to implementation of new nuclear technology. Um, so as a quick backup, the reactors that we have most places in the world today are called light water reactors, and they're just, they use water as the heat transfer medium, and they're usually quite large, about a gigawatt in scale. What we started looking at was how do you make advanced reactors commercially viable, and when I say advanced reactors, I mean they use some coolant other than water, or if they use water, they're um, really small, um, so much smaller and more flexible generation model. Um, so the barriers have a lot to do with capital cost, um, the potential a potential barrier that the operations and maintenance costs are too high, that the construction schedules are unpredictable. It's like all kinds of um, things that aren't really about the reactor core as much themselves, but a lot of implementation and operation ideas. And so the Meitner program, the first one, Modeling Enhanced Innovations Trailblazing Nuclear Energy Reinvigoration, um, was all about enabling technologies for advanced reactors, recognizing that nuclear engineers love to work on the core, but it's a lot of the other things that make it expensive. So we have um, a couple of teams working on construction technology and seismic protection. We have a couple of teams working on um, particular components that are needed. Um, we also have a couple of teams that are working on what are called micro reactors, which are um, small machines that are one, um, one to 10 megawatts in size. Um, and those are really interesting because they fit into a whole bunch of different markets that we don't normally think about for nuclear. The next program we have, we pulled out of OPEN, which is our sort of anybody can propose anything. Um, materials are a really big challenge in nuclear, typically, because they're high temperature and high radiation environments that often involve corrosive materials. So we pulled out um, some projects from OPEN that try to speed up materials research for nuclear. So an example is... 3D printing a bunch of little samples of different alloys and testing them with um, a specific coolant type to really, and then applying a machine learning rap, uh, algorithm to really rapidly iterate through materials discovery for nuclear. And then our newest program is called Gemina, and that's about operations and maintenance for existing react or for advanced reactors. So in the existing fleet, O and M is a high fraction of the cost, and that's a real challenge in some markets. So we want to set up the advanced reactors to have low-cost operations and maintenance. And to do that effectively, you need to think through it now so that you can have all the software you need and so that you can make design choices um, so that your system is easier to, oper to maintain and operate. There are some very serious people putting forth timelines that have new designs creating electricity as early as the next uh, five years or so. Um, 
when you think about what we've the teams that we funded and the the, the advanced reactor space generally, um, what do you think is next after this program? A lot of it is proving out some of these parts and pieces so they could be integrated together into an effective whole. So. Several companies are building larger experimental facilities on the way to proving out their own designs. Um, the Office of Nuclear Energy is aiming to build a versatile test reactor by 2026. Um, there are some companies planning to build demonstration plants in the mid-2020s. So all of those are opportunities where the technologies that we've been working on can get proven out and deployed um, and then eventually incorporated. And so the hope is that these micro reactors might be available commercially as soon as 2025 and some of the larger designs by 2030. And to get there, it is going to take some continued strategic government investment, but also private funding to come along and provide cost share. Um, and we've started to see more private dollars in the nuclear sector. And I think as these ideas get proven out, um, that will continue to accelerate. And that's, that's going to be a key piece. Yeah, there certainly is a huge role for private dollars to play, um, a, have a significant impact in, in, in creating this, 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 this element of the, the low carbon energy system. Um, you know, there's, 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 a lot of, there's a lot of momentum um, at, at the moment, but um, as I, um, you know, to paraphrase Winston Churchill, we're, we're really sort of at the, at the end of the beginning. We've, we've, we've got the designs and there's a lot of hard work left to do to build out these systems so that they um, you know, deliver, on, deliver on the promise. But um, it really means that there's, I think, a tremendous latitude for um, a lot of entities, RPE, um, DOE, NE, as well as the private sector to weigh in and, um, and, and jump in to, to shape what this, what this sector looks like and have a really positive impact on um, what our energy um, uh, mix looks like as well as how our you know, position and comp uh, competitive posture in the global marketplace looks like. So, uh, Rachel, I really have enjoyed working with you over these past years and um, wish you all the best. I know we'll be hearing uh, many great things from you uh, in, the, in, the, in the next stages of your career. Thanks. And I've, I've appreciated the opportunity and it has been so exciting to see the creativity really start to come out and the innovative mindset and people really start to think differently about how we can implement nuclear energy and, and get it over the line to be really relevant for solving our next phase of problems. Thanks.